Story continued from the Serenosaurus Kingdom playlist. The sun is beginning to set over the rivers and forests that dominate the late Jurassic region. And amongst the usual afternoon calls comes the sound of a giant in distress. Down in the floodplains, a sauropod has become trapped in the muddy earth. This elderly male is a Supersaurus, and at 40 meters in length, he has more than earned his name. Every year, these immense animals follow the rains here to feed on the various plants that grow in and around the floodplains. But the muddy soil within this area can be a death trap to any sauropod that treads there. And if one of the giants gets stuck or sinks into the mud, it's highly likely they won't get out. This is why some of the species like Diplodocus and Supersaurus have evolved such long necks, so they can stand on more stable earth and reach out far over the bogs and marshes to feed and not risk becoming trapped. Every so often, however, one or more of these massive herbivores makes a mistake and goes too far. Their limbs sink and are subsumed into the floodplains. It isn't until they try and lift their legs again that they realize too late their life-ending error. Instinctively they call out, alerting their herd which often saves most if not all around them. But for the trapped individual there is nothing that can be done, and so inevitably the herd moves on and the doomed member is left to die likely of either exposure or exhaustion. This is the fate of the elderly male. His herd has abandoned him, and his low bellows worn off other sauropods. The past few hours of struggling against his prison have exhausted him. Most of the male's rear legs are completely submerged, as are his arms, though his shoulders are completely free, and now he rests his neck and head awkwardly on the wet earth taking long, deep breaths. He is over a century old. His long life is due to his immense bulk, as once getting to a large enough size, no predator would even attempt to harm him. It is ironic that his mass would also be his undoing. Across the floodplain are the bones of other large sauropods that have succumbed to such a fate, their bodies feeding the ground around where they met their end, some of the more recently dead still have rotten flesh attached and are being broken down by everything from tiny scavengers to fungi. This process does not start with such small life, however. It begins with much, much larger scavengers, including some that are not patient enough to wait for an animal to die. The Supersaurus detects movement and slightly lifts up his head to see four figures moving towards him. As his vision cleared, he made out the shapes of a pack of Ceratosaurus, led by a scarred-faced female. The group heard the distress calls of the old sauropods some time ago, and have made their way here expectantly. Now they are approaching the giant head-on, but at a slower pace. They are not at risk of sinking into the mud, as they aren't heavy enough to be pulled under, though their feet do get caught on occasion so they aren't rushing to get to the still living and very dangerous herbivore. The Supersaurus raises his head a little higher, not registering these carnivores as threats. Despite being six meters long and weighing almost a ton, the Ceratosaurus looked minuscule compared to the sauropod, even with it prone and its limbs submerged. The four of them give the herbivore plenty of space as they pass its head, staying well out of range of its neck knowing that if it were to swing around such a powerful appendage, the force could send them flying through the air with minimal effort. When they are in line with the giant's midsection, they tentatively move towards him, their hearts beating from being so close to an animal of such immense power. The Supersaurus watches them approach him. Not since he was a few years old did he fear these creatures. After that, they simply became another smaller dinosaur that he saw from time to time. Though, his current predicament did cause some level of concern to enter his mind. The four Ceratosaurus were right beside him now, 
their bodies eclipsed by his shadow. The younger pair looked at each other nervously, but the lead female waited no longer. She stepped forward, opened her jaws, and sunk her teeth into the Supersaurus' side. The sauropod's skin was thick like rubber, providing an ample defense against such attacks, but her short snout and thick serrated teeth were up for the challenge. She pulled backwards, tearing a long line of hide back, and with great effort she peeled off the outer layer, exposing the softer flesh inside. Through it all, the Supersaurus didn't move. It may have been his exhausted state or his age, but eventually the herbivore recognized the sharp sensation. Pain. The old sauropod lifted his head and neck up and let out a horrified cry that made the Ceratosaurus flinch and echoed throughout the land. It was long and deep, but it would be far from the last he would make today. Seeing the Supersaurus wasn't able to move any part of himself other than his neck, the remaining Ceratosaurus moved in and joined their leader in tearing into the Titan. Spreading out across his side, they each bit into his hide and gradually removed the outer layer of skin. Then, they bit into the softer flesh and ate from their still living victim. Over and over again they bite and pull with their jaws, even lifting up one leg to brace themselves as they greedily strip thick chunks of skin and muscle. The whole pack tore off raw flesh, and the wounds clotted quickly, stemming the bleeding. The Supersaurus's tough physiology, keeping him alive and conscious, not allowing him to bleed out. As the carnivores sunk their jaws into his body, the Supersaurus wailed and tried to move, but his own exertions only worsened his pain, and he had no fight left in him now. His howls of anguish were audible for kilometers, but this was not something that was unusual here. Every year, large sauropods got trapped just like this, sometimes up to a dozen in one location. The cries of fear often turned to howls of agony, as these normally untouchable giants are eaten alive by the many large predators that live throughout this vast region. One of the most haunting and harrowing natural events in the entire Jurassic. The scar-faced female pulls her head out of the Supersaurus' side, having bitten deep enough to get to the bone, her face covered in blood and ruined flesh, checking the surroundings for any other predators. In the shrubs, one of the local Marshasaurus is waiting patiently to feed on the Ceratosaurus' scraps. Far off, a herd of Diplodocus graze as they always have, ignoring the agonized wails of the Supersaurus. And on a hill, the female spies a resting Torvosaurus. The giant watches the whole event unfold, not hungry enough to join the feast, simply waiting till he is able to fill his stomach once again. The Scarface Queen rejoins her pack in delving into the Supersaurus's shredded midsection. They gorge themselves, cutting through tendons and scraping bone. But for all they have eaten, they have only wounded the Colossus. It may take days for him to die. A violent and bloody end to a creature that spent a century being untouchable. Hello fellow travelers and welcome back. Today we will be breaking down a super-sized sauropod. Supersaurus. The first remains of Supersaurus were discovered in the Dry Mesa Quarry in Colorado in 1872. Only a few bones were found, including an ischium, multiple tail vertebra, and a shoulder girdle that was 2.4 meters tall. It was named informally in 1973 but was officially described in 1985 as Supersaurus vivinae, after the woman who discovered it, Vivian Jones. A second skeleton was found in 1986 in Wyoming, which was 30% complete, giving us a much better look at the animal. This specimen would later be given the name Jimbo. Other specimens would be discovered, and in 2015, a second species was named, that being Lorena hanensis from Portugal. 
Supersaurus lived in the late Jurassic between 153 to 145 million years ago. It was a sauropod in the Diplodocidae family, being more closely related to Diplodocus than to Apatosaurus. It was a truly massive animal, with estimates putting its length between 33 and 40 meters. Standing at around 6 meters high at the shoulder, and weighing between 35 and 44 tons. This makes it one of the largest sauropods, and potentially the longest animal to have ever lived that we have good evidence for. Though all the specimens were used for these estimates, Jimbo was more useful not just because of the more complete remains, but because he was skeletally mature when he died. This is something that is actually not usually found in sauropods, and though this does help to better calculate the genus's likely average size, it does make it harder to calculate how old he was. He was so old, in fact, that the vast amount of remodeling his bones had gone through made it nearly impossible to calculate it through regular means, with the first lot of results showing that Jimbo was 225 years old. Now, it's stated that this was incredibly unlikely, obviously, but regardless, Jimbo himself may be the oldest known dinosaur discovered so far. In terms of appearance, Supersaurus likely looks similar to other diplodocoids, though not as robustly built, with very elongated cervical vertebra, the longest being 1.5 meters in length. This helped to hold up its very long neck that could have been 11 meters all on its own. With such a long neck and standing so tall, it's possible that Supersaurus was able to graze and browse on plants at almost any height, allowing it to feed on anything it could reach. But we don't have the skull of Supersaurus, so this is hypothetical. Our best guess is that it's likely very similar to its close relatives. Now, of course, a video on Supersaurus wouldn't be complete without addressing Ultrasauros. So what is Ultrasauros? James A. Jensen, who described the first remains of Supersaurus, also reported another huge sauropod from the same quarry at the same time, informally calling it Ultrasaurus. Now, as you might guess, these remains turned out to be Supersaurus fossils, but the confusion came about because Jensen also found Brachiosaurus remains and thought they were parts of the new species, as the bone bed was a bit of a mess in that regard. That should have been the end of it, but another scientist in South Korea also named a sauropod he had discovered as Ultrasaurus. Since the South Korean sauropod was named first, Jensen had to adjust the name to Ultrasauros in order for it to be valid. Which didn't matter because in the end Ultrasaurus was found to just be Supersaurus, and so Ultrasaurus became a nomen dubium. But with the complexities of naming out the way, Let's address why I chose to depict Supersaurus in the narration. This is because, in certain quarries, this is believed to have happened. In some bone beds, sauropods are preserved with their limbs vertical, but the rest of their bodies spread out. It is believed occasionally the floodplains these giants grazed upon would become muddy death traps that the sauropods would get stuck in and sink into never able to escape. But while they were heavy enough to sink, theropods like Allosaurus, Ceratosaurus and others were light enough to walk across the floodplains without getting caught most of the time. A dead sauropod would have provided dozens of tons of meat, but if the sauropods hadn't died, but were unable to defend themselves, there was nothing stopping the theropods from feeding on the poor animal while it was still alive. We know this as the sauropod skeletons are often surrounded by theropod teeth, shed in the process of feeding. I have heard this be documented and even commented on a few times over the years, and it is described as one of the most brutal and horrific scenes that you can imagine taking place in the natural world. Supersaurus is no doubt one of the largest animals to ever walk the earth, and yet it is built very lightly possibly pushing the limits of how much the sauropod body plan could be stretched out, so to speak. It was so large, it likely didn't need to reach adult size to be mostly immune to predators. 
Though of course sauropods may have been like turtles in that only a tiny fraction of those that hatched ever made it to adulthood. But it is a reproductive strategy that allowed them to become the largest land animals to have ever existed. But what do you think of Supersaurus? And for my question of the week, at what size do you think Supersaurus and other sauropods would have to get to in order to be too big to hunt? What lesser known dinosaur would you like me to do a breakdown on next? And until then, please like, share, subscribe, and thank you for watching.